I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Oralee Athan. Um, and so before Dr. Athan speaks, I'll give um, you, many of you are already familiar with Dr. Athan, but um, for those of you who might be less familiar, just a little bit of background about her. So uh, Dr. Athan is a faculty member in um, our Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology, um, specifically in the Clinical Psychology Program, um, from which she also uh, got her doctorate degree. Um, Dr. Athan is the founding member of the Sexuality, Women, and Gender Project here at TC, um, and that project was created to envision and implement the next wave of theories and practices to improve the well-being of people at the intersection of these identities. Um, Dr. Athan's scholarly interests center on women's holistic development across the lifespan with a current emphasis on the transition to motherhood. And she teaches several classes on these subjects at TC, including the mother-child matrix and women and mental health. Dr. Athan's current research focuses um, on the subjective well-being of mothers, parent satisfac parenting satisfaction, and perinatal risk factors for psychopathology. She also is examining the history of funding of women's health research and contributing to the rationale for the creation of a new transdisciplinary field of reproductive and maternal mental health. She has presented in numerous conferences published in journals such as the Journal of Association of Research on Mothering and sits on the Academic Advisory Board of the Museum of Motherhood. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Athan speak about reproductive identity formation and sex education. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Athan. Many of our models have been um, male models uh, throughout the 
resources and they're thinking about how some of these models may be limited in terms of how they describe um, diverse experiences. Even <coughs> Sorry for the picture again, it's the only screenshot I could do, but uh, the way that this came about for me in terms of education and why such education is for me the next frontier is because it really started with awakening and creating courses here at the graduate level. So we had the first class uh, nationally on matrescence, which is what this class will be renamed upon moving forward, and I'll explain what that is in a moment, and reproductive mental health. Um, there's a lab as well where we do research, and then of course there's a way of kind of collecting all of your training and turning it into a certification as the world is awakening to maternal mental health and maternal screening and looking at the roots of distress of reproductive life. They're going to need someone to refer to, and that's often the problem. So I really encourage you that if you're sparked by anything that you hear today, that this is a new um, opening field, much like um, you will also have a job at Stanford Geriatric Mental Health, so if you have the baby boomers uh, aging.
disparities that exist, right? That not all of these rights are equally distributed. Then we have reproductive decision making, which is kind of not really the word out there, but it sort of is, which is saying, well, how do I know what to do with my experiences and my access to things, um, given that uniquely different set of problems than my my next door neighbor. And so what I'd like to introduce is a new concept of reproductive identity to the story. And before giving the whole story away, um, I will I'm gonna walk you through what a reproductive identity model uh, would look like. And by virtue of any identity model, we know that it's developmental, we have identity formation, we know that our identity is a life span experience that is shaped over time, is fluid and changes over time. Uh, both history affects our current identity, but we can also look ahead and imagine our future possibilities and so on and so forth. So that allows us to really not necessarily segregate who gets to have a reproductive identity, both in terms of the age but also in terms of other um, other demographics, including, let's say, gender. And I'm going to open that up, so I won't give you away too many. Um, a reproductive conversation moves beyond, I think, the limited ways that we talk about reproductive rights currently. That might sometimes also be contradictory um, and conflicting. So If you start asking uh, someone about that, if you start asking about if or whether they wanted to become a parent, if so, yes or no, or everything in between, when, the timing of when that happened, and how, how did it go down, right? Who was around? Um, what were the supportive structures? What were the actual events? Uh, other how is a more complex uh, notion that the roots of their distress could be located in this sort of if, when, how, or not. And that I did notice that there was often a lot of ambivalence and incongruence in all of those things. And ambivalence, as they say, is a hallmark of parenting, so we have to get used to it as early on as possible, because there are so many sort of coexisting um, and possibly unmetabolized you know, things that we're not aware of that, that are happening. So in my class, when we would talk about preconception, so we kind of walk through the arc of going through the parenting you know, experience. During the preconception piece, um, in order to prepare them to do proper preconception counseling, and I'll see what that means, uh, and that's a new term as well, and I just want you to know that preconception is often simply put in terms of taking folic acid or uh, you know, going to uh, prenatal visits for, for a pregnant woman to really talk about psychologically when you start to invite the conversation of mobilizing your reproductive potential, do you know some of these answers to these questions? Can you start to even think about them? Mm -hmm. So typically, if I ask my class something like, do you know whether you would like to become a parent one day? Which is, <coughs> I think is a trick question. It's certainly a loaded question because of how I phrase it. Um, they can keep it to themselves, yes, no, or maybe. That's not what I'm really after. When I ask them after a 
follow question, which is how do you remember why you know that? Or how you came to know that? I usually get zero hands. So for those who don't want to, sometimes they have an answer. But for those who do, they very rarely do. And even for those who are already parents, sometimes they cannot articulate. that you may or may not mobilize, either through your own agency or because of physiological realities or because of relationships or any of those things. So to not turn it into a given that it can or will happen because we have been known to have things like voluntary and involuntary child freeness um, or in infertility, that it's a potentiality, it's not a given. We can mobilize it or not depending circumstances and it's open to definition as well it may change over time just like we have gender fluidity as well that you may um, move in and out of phases in your life where your reproductive identity may shift and change and by the way that will also shift and change how others perceive you and how you're perceived um, and how you perceive them so Oddly enough, in looking in the literature, when we look at things like sexual identity formation, gender identity, racial identity, disability identity, feminist identity, identity models, there is no reproductive identity model of development. Um, we have had a historical decoupling of sex from reproduction, which we understand it's not the subject of today, but there are um, historical uh, <coughs> positive reasons, for example, being able to talk about sex and pleasure without talking about reproduction. Being able to also talk about sex and, and non-heteronormative sex as well, um, and reproduction being part of that, and also to remove the maternal mandate, which often was the case if you're a woman or a mother. So the, to also be a sort of sexual being uh, that can be happening. But, but, but what about that part of the conversation? And where is it being midwifed is the real question that I'm posing today. And how can we, how can we do that? So the next reframe I'm going to offer you, and I'm just going to be checking a little bit on our time, 
we had about how much longer. Okay. So in terms of a lifespan approach, and you'll have to bear with me, but all of this data is done on uh, women's bodies because the data isn't on fertility data, is not taken and really um, uh, is not collected from anyone else and only just recently. And I might understand that in terms of just fertility trends of pregnant bodies because otherwise you wouldn't know. Perhaps if you fathered a child or um, the, adoption, the adoption statistics are available, that's another, uh, another conversation. And then parents, statistics of parents and family building are another set of statistics. But what I want to tell you in terms of historically where um, reproductive decision making has been gendered and often falls on the shoulders of women and why I come in with a feminist theory on this is to look at what the data is showing. So at least in the US, because it's also, I want you to know, it's not only fluid for you as an individual, but it's fluid across time and geography and context, which tells me that there are no norms, right? If this thing changes and can be changed by culture and technology and all of those things, then that means that we have actually freedom to choose, depending. So US women on average want two children. They spend three years between pregnancy, um, trying to get pregnant, postpartum period. Um, they will spend nearly three decades trying to avoid an unintended pregnancy. And so more than three quarters of their reproductive life is, is squarely in reproduction, either avoiding it, the mobilization, or mobilizing it. And more than half of all women in the United States will have an unintended pregnancy by the time they reach 45 years old. So those are important statistics. And so how do we help um, someone navigate this, especially if it's going to be for most of their life. So how, you know, across the sort of, this is the bell curve of ages, which I'll, I'll let you know in a minute, how do you start to find what is just right and who determines that, right? So we're trying to turn it person-centered, actually a really important New York Times article came out recently around the use of IUDs uh, as a poverty cure, I really recommend that. Moving kind of reproductive counseling, which means contraception counseling, into person-centered because a lot of times we bring our own cultural values to who we think should and should not reproduce. So, and also how many and when. So we also have stigma around, let's say, um, adolescent pregnancies or uh, far too older mothers. You know, there is a way in which society does want you to have it during a certain time. So how do you even begin to think about that for yourself with all of those external pressures? So we most of the time only talk about it with extreme ends of the spectrum. Something to think about. But really, unintended uh, pregnancies, just as a kind of focal point, um, only because that's the only data we have uh, around fertility, is that it happens across the lifespan. And unintended pregnancies happen throughout. Of course, the proportion uh, happens mostly in 15 to 19 year olds, you're going to have about a 70% rate, depending on where you are in the country, uh, which tells you also just about the nature of the adolescent um, mind and education and all of that. But in terms of sheer numbers, actually the largest number of unintended pregnancies happen in the 20 to 29 or the 20 to 25 year range. So it's, it's less about actually high school that you got to worry about in one, in one sense do because the proportion is so high. But the sheer numbers is when actually, um, particularly for a woman, they move into uh, more greater independence, more sexually active, having sex more frequently with more, with more partners. And that's usually around the time that that happens. And then later as you, as you wane out of the reproductive window, there's still uh, unintended pregnancies as well, right? There, you, you may be one. <laughs> if you ask your if you ask your parents, and that's also very important. Many of you may not even know um, the reproductive decision making uh, or non decision making <laughs> of, of your parents. And of course, we also want to take this conversation out of just planning um, and also bringing in the word wanted, unintended pregnancy. Another great article in the Times just came out, um, I think yesterday, on a pregnancy whether you want it or not is also a very important thing to ask. Unintended pregnancy means both mistimed and unwanted births. As you've noticed, mistimed has a much different um, uh, spectrum than unwanted. 
unwanted usually is lower. So you can have an unplanned wanted child. Uh, you can also, and I'll show you why my research opened this question further for me, you can also have a planned unwanted child. So that tells you a lot about the incongruence and ambivalence psychologically of what might be operating within us. So this is a life course discussion. It often only talked about in the extreme spectrums, but really um, we need to know about it in the critical period as we enter the reproductive window, um, again, as we're moving into peak times, and then as we also move out. It, and this is just showing that actually the sheer numbers um, are, are more interesting when we get into emerging adulthood. Okay, so one is just right. So this was the New Yorker cartoon that I had to put in 2017 for, for particularly this group. Again, you know, different groups have different, different sets of concerns, but when is the right time? And I actually have a lot of students that come to me uh, asking how to navigate their education and professional goals with uh, folding in family formation. And is that possible? So um, do you do one first or the other? And culture will dictate, values and norms will dictate which is more important as well and what should come first. And also we need to think about the invisible structures that a particular society may or may not provide, physical and invisible, and in in allowing the co-participation of family and professional development, meaning universal daycare, right? Things like that. Family leave policies. Uh, how you think about whether you can do both at the same time is not only your individual problem to solve, but might also be the government and the states. Another great article in the New York Times recently, uh, talking or no, in the Atlantic maybe, which was saying that in Italy, if a woman's feeling stressed out about um, career, you know, work-life balance, as they call it, um, she blames her elected official. Uh, in the states, <laughs> we feel our, uh, our uh, perhaps our personal inadequacy cannot be able to make it, all of those things. So we really have to think about um, where are these givens and norms coming from? They're really quite dictated. Um, so I'm going to give a very quick brushstroke through the data to show you, at least in the 21st century where we are now, what is happening in terms of fertility trends, so that you can see what's happening. Local and global statistics as I see them, just like an anthropological lens gets you out of your own um, way of knowing. It can help with designalization, seeing how other people are doing it, very important. Um, and it can also take this personal story out into the population level to see what actually the human population is doing. And so I'll give you the uh, cliff notes right now because we might not be able to make it through. But the fertility trends that are happening are that we actually have a declining teen pregnancy rate of about 50%. Historic drop. Um, I'm not gonna give away why that might be happening just yet. The other thing that we have is an upward drift of delayed entry into childbearing, otherwise known as postponement, which is affecting both sides. We have both um, less younger mothers and we have more older mothers. So where do we locate ourselves? And then we have disparities for the marginalized in which, depending on where you are and who you are, you buck that trend. It might be happening differently for you. So I just want you to look at the red and the blue lines that are in a, in a light, the gray circle, and you're gonna see that's exactly right. 15 and 19 year olds, they're declining. The interaction effect rate. Right? And then we have, going up, we have the, um, 35 to 39 year old. So I, in my class we talk about being in sync or out of sync with your peer group and your culture, right? And um, depends, you know, I give an article that was maybe in the 90s and it says, I feel out of sync. Uh, I had my children when I was 30 and everybody was doing it younger and a lot of my students in my class go, wait, that's the norm. Everybody's doing it now at 30, right? Which shows you, no, that wasn't always the norm. The norm is changing. But that's the general trend, okay? And that's again what, what you're seeing in terms of um, increasing numbers, decreasing numbers on, on um, the left-hand side, increasing on the right. So um, this is also happening for unmarried women. There's also a phenomenon, an increasing phenomenon of 
um, independent parents by choice or single mothers by choice. Um, maybe seeing that not only they're getting older, but they're also unmarried. Um, there's also being, so entering, there's an increase in those statistics in terms of um, uh, traditional, conventional family structures that we see are, by the way, so outdated in every way. Um, no one's uh, having the, the, the traditional, 50% uh, of folks are not having a traditional family building experience as we know it. So many enter into parenthood without, without a partnering, you know, uh, and, and others also then leave through divorce, right? Either it never happened, and others are choosing by choice also to have a planned uh, uh, single parent. So it's really changing others, and also we have same-sex couples coming into the picture and everything in between. So postponing or dropping out, uh, what's happening here? There is a global decline in teen pregnancy. It's not just uh, local. We have some statistics there. I won't stay too long on each of these, but I just want you to hit that point. Okay? Um, it's happening for all of those 15 to 17, 15 to 19, 18 to 19. It's even more than that since this uh, data has uh, you know, since 2011. And um, it's happening at the same time, pregnancy rate is going down, birth rate is going down, but abortion rate is also going down. So when we're talking about um, fecundity and live births, right, pregnancy or pregnancy, we don't know if they end up in viable births at the end. That's a different set of statistics. It's also happening for different groups differently. <coughs> That's the reproductive uh, justice piece that but on average, everyone's declining, and also the, the Hispanic community is moving down the fastest. But it depends, because then if you go into New York City, we're going to show you some other statistics. So let me see if this is worthwhile to go through. Yeah, they're all dropping. So in general, at least I wanted to show you some New York City statistics, but uh, why don't we just move forward. The mean age of the mother is increasing. She's having less children. There's less spacing. Right, so if you're pushing up against your reproductive window, then you're gonna have to have children closer together. And there's a lot of confusion around mixed messages, right? Postponement, that is what we want to be happening if you're younger, but that is not what we want to be happening to older women. And that happens a lot of times with public health campaigns as well. I've been living in New York City long enough, um, uh, at least recently, to see a number of public health posters come through the subway. So I remember one that was something like, you know, in a nutshell, if you have a teen pregnancy, you're gonna lose you know, X amount of uh, income and professional development, um, don't do it. And then we have another public health announcement that comes with an hourglass that says essentially the biological clock tick tock is running out and you have to start thinking about your fertility. <coughs> Based just on the um, facial reactions of my audience here, uh, you, you do reflect the, 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 the public um, backlash that happened with both campaigns, which really stigmatized and or seemed to intrude on the reproductive decision making of a person that really at its core I think ultimately wants to be a human freedom and a human right to to make those decisions for yourself and not to have anyone sort of dictate or intrude uh, any of that. But I understand the public health conundrum too, which is how do we bring reproductive literacy or how do we help you start thinking about reproductive life uh, without actually showing you that your life is over uh, uh, in, in either in either, uh, in either way. And of course, just like my loaded question, we also don't um, ask questions like, um, just by virtue of having you think about your reproductive life means that we expect you to participate in it. So there are no uh, other types of messages that say something like, how do you feel about your infertility uh, if it's a permanent condition? Or how do you feel about the fact that by choice, you do not wish to become a parent. 
because there's just as much loaded stigmatization around those conditions as well for infertility, but also those identities. So the point of the 21st century landscape to let you know right now is that the right time for um, someone living in a particular context is reflected by his history and geography, as I've mentioned that. And the largest um, trends, the largest drivers of these trends are as follows. Gender empowerment, anywhere in the world where uh, educational um, and employment attainment happens <coughs> to girls and women, the fertility rates go down. And anywhere where access to reproductive, um, both contraception and conception aids, well, it's in the case of contraception, they go down in reproductive services. And then also reproductive technologies. You may know someone in your life, an aunt perhaps, who um, in the 80s was not going to be, did not have children for the very fact that there were no reproductive technologies, even if she wanted to become one to allow that to happen. Um, and or even social norms that might have allowed her to pursue, um, you know, to have an, an agentic choice to, to mobilize her family in, in maybe through adoption or through And then we have the diverse family building. So that's really changing everything. And I do want to let you know a little bit about the declining fertility uh, rates globally. How are you doing? 15 minutes? Um, including questions? Or? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So what I want you to know is that this actually reflects an overall trend globally. And what the teens are doing, where normally we often stigmatize them, what are those teens doing? They're reflecting adult. They're mirroring the adult world. Adults are declining in their fertility, and the teens are doing it twice as fast. So in a way, I want you to think about them both as they are listening and watching what we do. They're also might be doing a little bit um, better at sometimes in terms of they might be leaders or agents of change, right? Many of them are doubling up in contraceptions. A lot of the girls are using both, um, you know, their own form of birth control and condoms. That's what's being shown. Also, by the way, maybe it's teens are not hanging out in body with one another. In body, they're on um, their technological devices, so they actually are not engaging in actual, um, at least in heterosexual uh, contact that would lead to pregnancy. And that is another potential thing that's happening. But also, we have the other side of the spectrum where we also do have women who are talking about um, increasing rates of infertility, who are talking about pushing up the reproductive window in the other side. So the postponement sort of gear may be getting a little bit um, over, in overdrive. So we have to think about that. If you're opting in, so I always want to talk about the opting in, and we're going to talk about the opting out a little bit too. So they're mirroring the larger trends where in a fertility decline, not in a population decline, that's different. We have concurrently both aging folks on the planet living longer at the same time as we have um, less new folks being born. And we know that that has ec economic impact. We know that's happening in Japan. We know that's happening in, in the Mediterranean as well. Um, without, you know, here's just a quick statistic, at least in the US. And if you, there's a couple, go to our world in data, and these are um, fancy data GIFs, I guess, that move. And so you can see how it's happening in time. But what, let's say, um, certain areas of the world, it might have taken 100 years, let's say England and the US, I think they have they, in, in one part here. To it, but go, go to this um, data source uh, to get, let's say, each family um, to move from, let's say, an average of six children to three children. That's now happening rapidly in other places in the course of just a decade. So that's how sort of um, cultural transwesternization, globalization, you know, along with um, cultural things on TV, I don't know. <laughs> Other types of trends also do make their way, and what takes a long time in one place can then happen rapidly. That's a phenomenon in general. So I want you to know that 80% of the world now lives in a country where the fertility rate is equal to three children um, per woman or less. 
And this is one of the most fundamental social changes that has happened in our human history. That has been millennia in the making, and you are currently in this drastic drop. You're here. And that is a lot to do with, again, two things, both access to reproductive rights and, and uh, modulation of the reproductive um, potential, and the second one, largely the, um, which go together, the empowerment and employment of women that who then make educated choices uh, around all of those things. So that's pretty interesting. So I hope this has confused you about <laughs> where are you, um, or rather I hope that lets you know that you may be also unconsciously mirroring uh, global trends in ways that you don't know, or of cultural trends of your particular community or peer group that you don't realize, and to sort of pitch you out and start to have you think about if, when, and how for you. Um, we talked about the driving forces, of course, economic. Uh, people don't don't um, have children when there's a contraction. Uh, but still in all, there is still a gap between wanted fertility versus unwanted. And that if you were to ask these folks over time, they still have more children than they would like. It's interesting. So this idea of wanted and desire is really where I want you to live a little longer and think about your desires around that. And it's not only future, it's also retrospective. So if you've had children or participating, thinking about with each pregnancy, what were those constellations happening? Um, so, yeah, fertility rates are high when female social status is low. We already said this. When an average year of primary schooling grows from zero to six years, fertility should decrease by 40 to 80%. We have trends again. This is really great data. And also, what happens to fertility as women enter the labor force? Now, we have also just a whole host of new uh, reproductive technologies. And there's obviously an inverse relationship <laughs> between fertility and rate of contraceptive use. Um, so, in terms of sex education and how does this tie in? A lot of sex education around reproduction, I'll let you know in, in a moment. Um, okay, let's get you there. Okay, <laughs> this is what I wanted you to think about. <laughs> um, I'm going to move us through um, later. <laughs> determining the right time, we've talked about that. Uh, but here the ambivalent the hypothesis that I'm sort of pitching forward is that educating around contraception, what are the options, increasing access, in other words, having it within arm's reach uh, safely, does not solve the problem because internally, how do you know which one to choose? With a conundrum, I don't want to use the problem, the conundrum. Because how do you know which one you want to use if you don't sort of kind of understand those things? And really, likely we're all mixed up. If I want to, when, how. Um, also, again, that means in terms of what the family is saying, what the peer group is saying, what the partner is saying, what all of those different um, things are happening in any kind of family building experience, it might not be so straightforward. And actually our rates, at least when we're talking about pregnancy in the United States, are 50-50 at best. The ambivalence shows it. It has a very hard time moving that needle. Uh, we've moved from 51%, 49% plan and plan, unintended pregnancies rather, into maybe about 47, 48%, uh, regardless of all these improvements. It, ha it has helped really for the team. Overall, unintended pregnancies are about 50-50. This is a little bit of a graph that I pointed to in a moment that we can have these coexisting or competing um, ideologies inside. Um, but I wanted to let you know just a couple of interesting things about contraceptive use and uh, around that is that um, I kind of talked about a lot of them were wanted, but um, of the women who have reproductive age, six out of 10 report using contraception, four out of 10 do not. So we see contraceptive non-use among women of all ages, actually. It's not um, particularly higher. Uh, we'll get into those stats another time. 
But if you go into some of the <coughs> literature even, you'll even find a group that is sexually active, fertile, not pregnant, postpartum or trying, clearly at risk for an un unplanned pregnancy. They don't want to have a child, but they're not actively, um, uh, they're not actively using contraception, even though they don't actually desire a pregnancy. And so, at least in one article uh, that I think had something to say to me, um, that the ambivalence of pregnancy is not captured by timing uh, of when it's happening, the unintention that's wrong, but really around contraceptive risk taking, because it suggests that women and couples have a complex mix of traits, desires, and intentions, resulting in a spectrum of behaviors uh, that underlie how they actually do or do not practice contraception. And the best chances of reducing this, as I see it, is from a psychological behavioral health point of view, which is to really look at their desires and integrate that self-knowledge uh, and bring into greater alignment, alignment with their actual behavioral use of contraception. So this is based on discordance theory and um, cognitive dissonance, and we also have seen this in other places. For example, a conflicted sexual identity has been tied to inconsistent co condom use and HIV uh, prevention in some, in some studies. So thinking about that the more sort of we are um, in congruence with our identity and our and our self-awareness around what that identity is, the more likely we're going to behave and choose uh, relationships, you know, uh, technologies, all of that that are in alignment. So um, I hope I've made my case <laughs> as a psychologist. Um, I will end there, other than to say that um, with one minute left, that in terms of sex education, the chances of us getting into it, but we are. We're training sex education, health, sexual health educators right now. Because we looked at all the curricula that were out there that they were using in New York City. And I want to let you know that sexual health education is just one slice of the health education pie. So that when a student uh, comes in, they might get only one semester in middle school, one in high school of sex education, um, of health education. And even in that, they have to cover a lot of topics. Um, they have to cover a lot of topics like hygiene, right, all sorts of other um, health health concerns. And then even within sex education, we have to do gender identity, we have to do, um, you know, everything that are the ingredients in here. So where are we gonna put this missing ingredient? And most of all, what I wanna do is make it not fear-based. So just like we've started to talk about pleasure and consent, um, positivity in sex, uh, consent in sex, inclusivity, LGBTQ, right? Same thing, we want to talk about intent, like consent, not just prevention, intent, intentionality. We want it non-fear-based, so talking about also the pleasures, you know, and, and pains, um, and to make it inclusive. And I just want you to know that in general, if they are gonna be talking about parenting in the sex education space, historically, it's done often through, you know, carrying that little proxy around them, whether it's an egg or a dog. And I, I, I think ultimately it is to show you how hard it is. So that's kind of a, prevent, a preventative method. So we're here to fill a curricular gap. Wish us luck. We have uh, uh, fellows coming in every year to take this training on reproductive identity formation. And I'm open to questions. Um, so you're talking about how society can sometimes <laughs> society can sometimes shape what time people decide to start having children. But I'm curious to what extent you think some people's choices are made by science. Like for me, um, friends in medical school, and just the knowledge that the longer you wait, the more you increase uh, the chances that like your baby might have Down syndrome or that there might be uh, developmental disabilities. And then earlier, I know just as a as a person that you're working on emotion regulation, like there's there's personality traits that might make you less ready. So I, I like to think that sometimes when I thinking about when I would want to, that it'd be informed by both, but do you think that society plays a bigger role than maybe the foundations of science and research that we have? Well, you're, you, you seem to be literate, you know, to have literacy of reproductive sort of biology and, and, and 
sort of facts, and that comes with education. Mm -hmm. And not everyone has that privilege, number one. Um, number two, I still actually have people know, how do you know you know that? Because even the data uh, of how reproductive, um, the reproductive life cycle happens is uh, probably stuck in the 40s. Probably the samples that they use um, wow. are not entirely um, optimal. Uh, a lot of the recommendations that they have come from maybe like a French population, you know, <laughs> uh, a certain uh, sample size. How do they know? I mean, another great NPR piece just yesterday, uh, because it was Women in Science Day, uh, is that uh, we still don't know how the cervix works mm -hmm. in the uterus in Columbia right now. We still are stuck in the 1940s. It took female scientists to come in and actually look at literally the structure and why, why some have um, uh, miscarriages or not. So please be informed, absolutely. I think it should be absolutely based on education, though as we know, uh, values and norms and, and pressures uh, can sometimes, you know, uh, you know counter the science. Yeah. At the same time, the science, and that's why I'm trying to drive, you know, conversations around funding in, in women's health is that the science may also not be entirely um, robust. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for the information. I think you spoke a lot about the social norms and the cultural norms. And I'm thinking back uh, from where I am. There's so much that the gender is such a huge piece when it comes to having access to uh, contraception mm -hmm. and having the desire because it is so much dependent on the woman's body is often, you know, so much dependent on what the family wants, what the spouse wants, and there's so much violence in relationships and there's so much inequality that oftentimes the control is through pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole piece, and I'm glad you're working on the curriculum because there's a whole piece that, that needs to go on gender and violence and how that for so many people is an issue. And then from, I'm from Pakistan and so there's so many misconceptions about contraception and still they exist and there's this belief that, you know, this is to control our population, this is to control the Muslim population and there's so many misconceptions that a lot of women and couples are not choosing contraception. <coughs> they end up having a pregnancy and then they go for unsafe so there's this whole cycle of those dynamics, the politics around the issue as well. So it becomes more complicated. Uh, it goes beyond the just the economy a woman has to work on. So it's very fascinating to see that you know, there's a discussion which is maybe at a different level, obviously because of different dynamics, but that is a huge piece for us in our dynamics. Absolutely. Um, what I will say is um, we struggle with and also purposefully put it into a genetic language. Um, into empowerment language, knowing how disempowering and often powerless uh, women can be, can be in terms of making those decisions. Um, but it's, it's all the more necessary for that to at least bring it into a genetic language, even knowing the constraints. Number two, um, another New York Times, our population council, if you want a sex education um, free curriculum, which is very powerful, is done by the population council, and they have shown in their own data too that gender empowerment is the way into to that conversation. Um, but again, like you see, those are, by the way, those are reproductive identities. Yeah. I didn't ever use the word ideal or normal or um, anything. So in fact, and I don't, someone very wisely in my own advisory board said, also reproductive identity is not an individual identity, it's a community identity. So in some communities, right, the reproductive identity, if there's a teen pregnancy, the community rushes in and supports. Mm -hmm. In others, they run they run away. In some reproductive identities, it's about having a multi-generation family with spacing of only about 15 years, right? About 20, you know, maybe. And, and in others, it's, you know, you never get to see the next generation, it's so widely spaced. So communities, even if they are troublesome to you, you know, um, it is an identity, that's what they're doing. It, that's the shape they're in. And then we can start talking about, if we place it in that way, that's the shape you're in, then you can start to think about how do I want it shaped differently? Not better, differently, do I like the shape I'm in? And by the way, one of the most fascinating dis um, 
facts that I came across. I don't want to give an actual statistic because uh, I don't have it memorized. But the rates of sterilization, uh, I thought, were going to be higher in males than um, women. Actually, the highest users of sterilization are females, chosen by female. Well, again, coercion, that's what we talk about. That's why the IUD is poverty cure, long-lasting reproductive interventions have a, uh, a, a, a long history of also being discriminatory. Um, so we have to think about where that comes from, but some women themselves are choosing sterilization as the only way uh, to protect bodily integrity around reproductive life. So, or, and or they finished having their children and now you know, they really want to end that cycle. So it looks like... Yeah, I just learned that uh, there's another group coming in. So I just want to give a final round. To quickly say a few notes, I know those of you who have to leave will leave. If you haven't signed it already and you're in one of my classes, please look for those sign-in sheets. Um, just to sort of wrap up, um, we have two more camp talks already for the rest of the year. The next one is actually myself and Dr. Cha will be giving an update on our research um, studies, including the research study in suicide prevention um, that is related to these breakdown series. Um, so come next time for an update. And then the one after that is the student showcase, which actually got created. Anyone who does research um, as a student, we want to get your abstracts and we want to review them. We would love for you to be a part of our student showcase. Um, the website is live. So I know um, Dr. Cha talked a little bit about this last week, so I'm just going to blow through it quickly. But uh, submit your abstracts. Uh, we want to see a nice representation of student research, any research related to child and adolescent mental health, including mothers. Um, basically, we will, it's a blind review, and we will select the top scoring abstracts for a presentation, five to eight minute presentation of, for each person, and then we'll have usually a longer reception so people can kind of mingle and get to know each other. All right, so the website is live. Uh, you can go to our website um, right here, look for it, and submit online. All right. Thank you.